Well, good morning. This is uh, Ian R. Crane, and um, well, it's uh, a little later than I normally broadcast. It's the morning of Friday, 28th of December, 2018, and uh, as you can um, see behind me, um, I've got a little bit of storm damage. That's one of the joys of uh, outside living at this time of the year. Um, I got back to uh, my bolt hole in the southwest late last night to find that uh, I just had a little bit of um, buffeting from the uh, storms that uh, assaulted the southwest. But anyway, my problems are minor compared to some that uh, are being experienced by others. And um, I'm going to start this morning's uh, broadcast uh, by moving away from the drama of uh, the storms. And that's a much better scene behind me on this frosty morning here. Anyway, I actually want to start this morning's broadcast by reminding everybody that uh, David Noakes is uh, wallowing in Wandsworth Prison. And uh, his uh, prison number is A7081DY. And you can write to David at PO Box 757 Heathfield Road, Wandsworth, London, SW183HU. And I will put uh, that address under uh, this uh, video later this morning. Now, David is serving um, 15 months of jail in Wandsworth Prison for the heinous crime of developing a product that had proven to very effectively treat cancer right up to stage four cancer um, had been proven in the US by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bradstreet to be a very effective treatment uh, for autism. And uh, it uh, basically is an immunotherapy product. It reboots the body's natural immune system. But this product was so effective that it threatened the supremacy of Big Pharma and its domination of the cancer industry by effectively forcing people who are desperate to find a, an effective treatment into chemo and radiotherapy, a treatment that has an efficacy of just 2.3%. In other words, if you undertake chemo or radiotherapy, then you have a 97.7% probability of dying, if not from the cancer, then from the chemo or the radiotherapy. But this is all that orthodoxy offers. And uh, as is very well known by the alternative community, there are many other proven effective treatments for cancer and other uh, similar diseases or illnesses, yet they are suppressed by Big Pharma. And uh, the pharmaceutical industry got its henchmen, the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency in the UK to do their dirty work and uh, effectively shut down uh, David's company, uh, Bio uh, Immunotech. And uh, then after subjecting them to uh, three and a half years of purgatory. Finally, the case came to court at Southwark Crown Court in London in uh, November. And uh, in the last week of November, uh, David was sentenced to 12 months for the manufacture and distribution of an unlicensed medicine and uh, three months for money laundering. And the, you know, the judge made it very clear that he was very uncomfortable with the money laundering aspect because as is, is more usual in money laundering cases, it's from you know the uh, um, ill-gotten gains from crime and uh, it is hidden. And yet David had made no attempt to hide uh, the revenues that he had gained from uh, selling this product and uh, his accounts were completely open. But uh, nonetheless, because he had effectively made a living from uh, marketing this very effective product, uh, a three months was added to the 12 months 
uh, sentence that he got for the distribution. So, 15 months in all. Now, all being well, uh, he will um, uh, be released after uh, probably about four months, in fact, potentially around about the end of March. And then he'll be on a tag for uh, a few months uh, before uh, serving out the, the rest of his time on suspended sentence, effectively. And, um, of course, you know, this really should ram home the magnitude of the threat from a corporatocracy. Because the corporatocracy sees every human life form as nothing more than a, a revenue stream. And obviously that is, uh, you know, very direct in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, perhaps it's less direct with other industries, but nonetheless, that is still the corporatist's philosophy. If you can't make money out of someone, then uh, basically what is their point? So uh, please, if you get the opportunity to drop David a line, to just send him a postcard or send him a, a letter of uh, support, then I know he will really appreciate it because uh, he's certainly, obviously, uh, as one would expect, not finding uh, prison life particularly easy. And now please, if you do write to him, please do put a return address on the, both the envelope and on whatever you put inside the envelope and the letter, because that apparently helps it uh, through the initial security process. And obviously, uh, we'll be talking more about um, David Noakes and uh, GC Math in the coming weeks and months, because although David has been jailed, the whole uh, issue of suppressed medicines is very much now out of the proverbial bottle. And uh, Judge Nicholas Lorraine Smith made it very clear that in his opinion, GC uh, GCMAF was not on trial and the efficacy of GCMAF was not disputed. And in uh, his opening remarks prior to sentencing David, he actually said he had no doubt that many people had benefited from uh, taking GCMAF and that many people would benefit in the future. But of course, uh, um, not if uh, Big Pharma has anything to do with it. So, you know, actually it's down to each and every one of us to uh, um, make sure that Big Pharma know that the genie is very much out of the bottle and, uh, you know, we know their game. Meanwhile, meanwhile, you know, this morning, it's uh, exactly one week since I uh, put out my first video on the drone gate incident at Gatwick. Now, at that time, the incident had um, started the night before, around about 9 p.m., just in time to get into the national media. So it was pretty much the headline in all of the uh, national press last Friday. And um, I immediately smelt the BS. There was a lot about this story that didn't add up. And my capability and capacity for discretion and discernment gave me the opportunity to call BS right from the get-go, which has, uh, funnily enough, proven to be the case. But uh, here we are, you know, one week on, and there is still no sight of a drone. And uh, even um, you know, uh, Chief, was it Superintendent um, uh, Tingley of Sussex Police had suggested that, you know, perhaps there wasn't actually a drone at all. But then he was uh, castigated by the British government and uh, government ministers for saying that. And uh, they said, well, you know, no, no, there was just a, a miscommunication. Well, unless one of the government ministers actually saw the drone, then basically there is no evidence of a drone, period. Other than the uh, Chief Operations Officer of uh, Gatwick, Chris Woodruff, actually going on camera and saying, right now, there's a drone over my airfield. But uh, he didn't actually show any evidence of that and none has been produced since. And of course, uh, obviously very unfortunate that so many people, so many families, you know, were affected by this at a, at a time when they were looking forward to their Christmas break. But, uh, you know, instead of pointing the finger 
at uh, rogue drone operators, you know, perhaps they should actually take a much closer look at the Gatwick management team and what the Gatwick management team had to gain by putting this story out. And of course, sadly, uh, by the end of uh, Friday, uh, two local residents, Paul Gate and Elaine Kirk, were taken into custody on suspicion of being those rogue drone operators. And of course, it is now very clear that those arrests were totally outrageous. It seems that the only evidence that the police had was a phone call from a neighbour. So I guess uh, whomever it was that um, Mr Gate and Miss Kirk had upset in recent months uh, decided this was an opportunity and uh, made a phone call to Sussex Police. And Sussex Police quickly went onto social media and found a picture of a remote control helicopter and a review written by Mr Gate uh, about a, a drone kit. And on that basis, they arrested him, despite Mr Gate having an absolutely rock solid alibi that he was actually working while this uh, saga was unfolding. And of course, the media frenzy kicked off immediately. Um, you know, the outrageous headlines, the mail uh, running the headline, are these the morons that have destroyed people's holidays? Um, and uh, um, Piers Morgan uh, labelled them as clowns and terrorists in, uh, in one of his broadcasts. And, you know, what's now very interesting is to see the media quickly backtrack over those assumptions based on absolutely nothing, not a shred of evidence. Well, Piers Morgan has now issued an apology and um, dare I say that has nothing to do with uh, sincerity. It's uh, more a concern about him being sued uh, by Mr. Gate and uh, Miss Kirk once they uh, realise the magnitude of the opportunity ahead of them to bring the British media and uh, indeed Sussex police to account for their outrageous uh, treatment. And uh, Mark Stevens, who's the head of media law at Howard uh, Kennedy Law Firm, has said they have a strong legal case. And he has suggested the compensation of between 75 and 125,000 was a reasonable expectation. Well, let me suggest that that's a reasonable expectation from every single media outlet that vilified Mr. Uh, Gate and Miss um, Kirk from the get-go without, without a shred of evidence. And uh, Jane Merrick, writing in The Independent, says, it was a story with huge implications, yet very few facts. And into that vacuum were thrown an innocent couple. And, uh, you know, the um, uh, police and media have responded uh, by saying, well, you know, we got a call from neighbours and, uh, well, we had to go and investigate. Bottom line, it was, it was the only lead they had at the time and uh, they jumped at it uh, without a second thought for the ramifications on the lives of uh, Mr Gate and uh, Miss Kirk. So... Let's have a look at what else has happened since then, of course, because who really benefits here? And as I had alluded to previously, there is still the very, very strong probability that um, there had been some kind of systems failure at Gatwick. And uh, rather than actually take responsibility, somebody on the Gatwick management team came up with the drone scam to deflect attention to deflect responsibility, and of course, most importantly, to deflect any financial liability. So, you know, not only were the police all called in, but then the military were called in to deal with a drone, a toy drone. Now, you know, people, a lot of people have done research over the past week into drone technology, and many of even the relatively low-end hobby drones, not the toys, but the hobby drones, have built-in geofencing software, which uh, 
prevents them from entering restricted airspace. But, uh, uh, and also there is, you know, the technology to identify where the transmission is coming from. And one of the things that was brought to my attention is the military technology from the 1970s, which uh, back then was known as Fast Chimp and Clarabelle. Now, Clarabel was a direction finder, and this direction finder was so sophisticated that it could, 40 odd years ago, identify the direction from which a sniper's bullet had uh, originated. And uh, apparently, you know, there, is some in, there was some interesting banter on, um, amongst the military at the time as to who would be operating this, because if you're operating it, you had to stand up. And uh, in association with Clarabel was Fast Chimp, which uh, had the capacity to intercept the uh, remote control signals. Because back in the 1970s and 1980s, one of the great concerns about the British military, uh, particularly in Northern Ireland, was remote controlled devices. And Fast Chimp was a military technology designed to intercept the signals being used to detonate uh, remote devices. So this is technology that was available 40 years ago, and uh, yet apparently we don't have the technology today to identify either the OcuSync uh, transmission of uh, drone operators or the 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi signal of, uh, used by drone operators. And then of course, you know, we have uh, the fact that the British government established a COBRA meeting, a COBRA meeting, which is called to discuss very, very serious potential threats to the UK. And COBRA being called over a drone. Now, there have been other hypotheses put forward as to uh, why COBRA was called. And in fact, the Daily Mirror I did run a report uh, earlier in the week um, suggesting that uh, there was actually a UFO and I believe that they did actually publish a photograph. Now I can't vouch for the uh, veracity of that photograph, no more than I can vouch for the veracity and integrity of any of the British media. But nonetheless, that was a hypothesis being put forward and the fact that Cobra was established would suggest that uh, there was something a little bit more at uh, stake here than just a hobby uh, drone. Well, of course, who else benefits? Well, the Israeli uh, company um, that produces the Drone Dome. And this is an Israeli company uh, known as Skylock. And of course, uh, this is a military technology that has been adapted for civilian use. And the um, a marketing director of uh, Skylock revealed a couple of days ago that they've had a 40% increase in inquiries over the past week, i.e. since the advent of um, the drone scam a scare at uh, Gatwick Freudian slip there. Well, <sighs> Israeli technology, whether or not that's what's being deployed, uh, Chris Grayling now says that uh, there is going to be uh, something, something like that technology uh, applied at airports uh, throughout the, the UK. Meanwhile, yesterday, Gatwick uh, announces that uh, a 50.1% stake of uh, the uh, current holding is being sold to the French infrastructure company, Vinci. Now, just to give you some idea of how significant an investment Gatwick has been for GIP, the Global Investment uh, Partnership. Uh, they acquired Gatwick in 2009 for uh, one point, I think it was 1.9 billion. And they've just sold a 50% stake for, I believe it's uh, 2.3 billion. So the, on the basis or 2.9 billion, I believe it is actually. So on that basis, Gatwick Airport has a market valuation of something in the region of just shy of 6 billion. And this is in the hands of private investors who 
uh, paid themselves 650 million in dividends, according to the last financial report. And funnily enough, um, that was the same amount as was uh, issued in debt. So <laughs> this is the way the corporations work. Pay themselves outrageous dividends whilst putting the company into increasing amounts of debt. You know, shouldn't major infrastructure like airports be nationalized? I mean, I absolutely and unashamedly am a social capitalist. I believe capitalism has an important role to play. But those who head up the corporations have an important social responsibility, which we see very, very little of today. The, what we have today isn't capitalism, it's corporatism. It's rampant corporatism, where those who uh, uh, hold the financial reins are only interested in self-gratification. It's greed, greed, and more greed. And the sooner that the people realize that the corporations and their puppet politicians do not have their best interests at heart, then maybe, maybe they will actually wake up and uh, do something about it. Because this is the crucial element. The establishment, the corporations, the puppet politicians all rely on people doing nothing, being more interested in literally just trying to keep a roof over their head and food on the table than um, actually finding the time or creating the time to participate in bringing about a better world, a world which recognizes the importance of every sentient being on the planet. Well, you know, we're coming to the end of 2018 and, uh, you know, I have a very strong sense that 2019 is going to be a very, very significant, even perhaps seminal year. And unfortunately, that may mean that things have to get a lot worse before they get better. But the people are waking up. And my thanks go out to, um, um, what's her name, the, the Queen, for doing a broadcast where she discusses austerity, calls upon the people to pull together while sitting in front of a golden piano. And I think that that broadcast also helped to wake people up to the massive inequality and to the massive hypocrisy of those who purport to be the leaders of this nation and those who purport to have the best interests of the global population at heart. Well, it's time to actually think for ourselves and come to our own realization as to how we could improve the situation, not for ourselves, but for future generations because as I have said many times, and I will say many, many times in the future, unless we, the collective we, actually pick up the gauntlet, then we will be condemning future generations to lives of unimaginable abject misery. So in these last few days of 2018, if you have the opportunity, because you're not, you know, you're not working until perhaps next Wednesday, then maybe it's time for a bit of reflection to perhaps consider just how, how you can contribute to this great challenge that humanity faces. But meanwhile, on the grassroots level, please, if you have even just a few minutes, please drop a line to David Noakes, prisoner A7081DY, wallowing in Wandsworth Prison, in England for having the audacity to develop and distribute, in many cases for free, an extremely effective cancer treatment. Thanks for joining me this morning and I will be back with you on New Year's Eve on Monday morning at 8.30.
for the last broadcast of 2018. You have a great weekend.